Over the past 10 plus years, artificial intelligence has experienced breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough. In computer vision, in speech recognition, in machine translation, in robotics, in medicine, in biology, and the list goes on and on and on. Underneath all of these breakthroughs has been one single subfield of artificial intelligence, deep learning. Today's guest pioneered many of the early deep learning breakthroughs and continues to lead the charge today. For his work, today's guest won the Turing Award, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize, but for computer science. Today's guest has their work cited over half a million times. That means there are over half a million and counting other research papers out there that build on top of his work. In the process, today's guest has made Montreal into one of the world's foremost destinations for aspiring AI scientists and entrepreneurs. Today's guest is also one of the most socially conscientious scientists I know. I am, of course, talking about no one less than Yoshua Benjo. I'm extremely privileged and excited to have you on the show today, Yoshua. But before we dive in, um, I want to thank our podcast sponsors, Index Ventures and Weights and Biases. Index Ventures is a venture capital firm that invests in exceptional entrepreneurs across all stages, from seed to IPO. With offices in San Francisco, New York, and London, the firm backs founders across a variety of verticals, including artificial intelligence, SaaS, fintech, security, gaming, and consumer. On a personal note, Index is an investor in Covariant, and I couldn't recommend them any higher. Weights and Biases is an ML ops platform that helps you train better models faster with experiment tracking, modeling dataset versioning, and model management. They are used by OpenAI, NVIDIA, and almost every lab releasing a large model. In fact, many, if not all, of my students at Berkeley and colleagues at Covariant are big users of Weights and Biases. Yosha, so happy to have you here with us. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's so nice to have you on, Yoshua. Um, and of course, we, we've, we've met many times in the past, especially thanks to the CIFAR uh, Learning in Machines and Brains workshops that you've organized for many, many years with many great um, discussions. Um, maybe yeah, as a, the first thing I'm really curious about is you did a lot of work on language models before they became cool. Um, you work on recurrent neural nets and so forth 10, 20 years ago. Um, what was your motivation at the uh, time? Sorry, it's more like 30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what was your motivation at the time to, to push this? Well, I wish nobody else was, was thinking of language that way. Uh, well, in my PhD, so I got my PhD in 1991, um, I was interested in recurrent nets and, uh, and convolutional nets and probabilistic modeling of sequences because my supervisor was into speech recognition. And uh, I proposed methods that were pretty close to the ones that 20 years later ended up in... Uh, you know, Google's uh, and IBM's and Microsoft's speech recognition systems that, that came out around 2010, 2012. Um, and language, I really got into at the end of the 20th century. And it's really building on the ideas of Jeff Hinton with distributed representations. So I had this intuition that using what we now call word embeddings rather than purely symbolic representations based on counting n-grams that was the state of the art then, statistical methods. You could have a sharing of statistical strength because the same word can occur in many different contexts and many different n-grams that would 
potentially defeat the curse of a dimensionality that hits engrams. Um, and uh, actually, I started writing about this idea even before working on language uh, with my brother Sammy in 1999, 2000 or something. Um, is a sort of neural nets to learn complicated high dimensional discrete distributions with many, many variables. Uh, how could you possibly do that, right? And uh, using representations, of course, of these symbols. And Jeff had been writing about these things for at least 10 years, right? and, and I had. Um, but then uh, around 2000, I started applying this to modeling actual like texts. And this is how the neural language model, as we called it, emerged. Um, I'd, at the time, I didn't think it was that revolutionary. It seemed like an obvious thing to do. Um, and it didn't pick up right away. It took like a decade, really, for people in uh, NLP to start really um, slowly picking it up. And uh, yeah, but it's it's a very powerful concept that uh, I think uh, not everyone who applies it in modern NLP um, understands, but it's really important too. It's interesting because at least for me personally, when I first saw neural nets being applied very successfully, for example, in computer vision and speech recognition, I, I personally felt that it would need to be very different to also apply it to, to language. And that was just my wrong, for that matter, reaction at the time, because it felt to me that vision and speech are signals, real numbers, neural nets process real numbers, but language seems to have these discrete concepts oh, but you have that discrete, so fundamentally different. You have discrete concepts in speech too. You have phonemes. And in fact, one of the questions I worked on during my PhD and people had been, had been thinking about is uh, not just the relation between the low-level signal and individual categories that are phonemes, but also the high-level part. So how what's the joint distribution of the level of phonemes conditioned on, on the signal? And, up to now, I'm still like working on these kinds of questions, thinking about how we can. Now I'm thinking about how you can do this in an elsewise way that that is discover the right categorical representations that form complicated interactions at, at the abstract level. Given that we only observe low level signals. Now, when you said earlier that you you were investigating distributed representations which is kind of the opposite of discrete <laughs> representations in, in some sense, or can be. Um, it, and you talk about the word embeddings and so forth. Do, do you, I guess, do you see language as effectively under the hood also being a continuous medium rather than discrete? Well, it's both. So I have this theory about uh, Qualia. I don't know if this is a concept you're familiar with. Uh, Not yet. This is a subjective experience that you have that is difficult to, that is ineffable, that is difficult to translate in words. So when you, you see something and then you, you talk about it, you're conscious of it, there's something in your subjective experience of, of what you're experiencing that, that is uh, very difficult to uh, express, but you feel it and it's important. Well, it's the word embeddings. Mm. So um, the, the theory I have is that, and it, which is consistent at least with what we know from neuroscience, is that um, when uh, something arises to consciousness, it's your, your brain, your cortex, dynamical system converging to some attractors. And by definition, attractors are mutually exclusive, which means they have a discrete nature. It's either dog or cat. You can't have both at the same time. The naked cube, you see it one way or the other way. You can flip from one to the other, but it's a discrete choice. But of course, an attractor is just a particular pattern of activation of the neurons in your brain. It's just one towards which your dynamics is going. It's like you've decided somehow, something in your mind has, or your, in your brain has decided that it's going to be dog. And so 
the, the dog attractor is also a very high dimensional pattern of activation of neurons in your brain, as well as being an attractor that competes with the other attractors. And actually it's not dog, it's going to be more like a sentence, like there's a red dog walking on the street or something, right? Like our thoughts are not like single words, they're usually more like a configuration of concepts. But the idea is, it, it seems to plausible that in our brain, we uh, have um, sort of a dual representation. There's like a some discreteness that's going on. We're, we're like we have words. We we take discrete decisions. You know, as a as a you know roboticist, you know that mm-hmm. you have to decide. Like the, the robot goes to the left or goes to the right. You know, these are these are like hard decisions sometimes they have to take. But but behind these hard decisions, there's a rich distributive representation that allows to associate these discrete entities to other discrete entities that have some similarity, right? It's a similarity space. That's what Mm -hmm. this representation is really are. And it's a rich one so that everything is connected to everything in that representation space. Whereas symbols are kind of stupid. Like there's nothing that says that dog and cat have something in common just by the symbol itself. Now, you've not been afraid to talk about, I would say, topics most researchers shy away from, like what does it mean to be, you know, a conscious part versus unconscious part of, of what our brain is doing. And and I want to really dive into that because uh, we've also written a, a beautiful recent piece on inductive biases for deep learning of, uh, for deep learning of high level cognition. Um, but before, before we get into consciousness and, and higher level cognition, I'm curious how, how how do you see the evolution that we have seen play out over, from your perspective, the last, let's say, five-ish years, where language models have gone from, in some sense, it, something most people don't didn't even pay attention to in the early days that you were working on it, to becoming the center of attention of pretty much everything. And that's happening in AI. The underlying architectures have changed a little bit from RNNs to transformers using attention mechanisms, which, by the way, you also pioneered um, in machine translation and, and speech recognition and so forth. So I'm kind of curious from your perspective, how do you see that evolution and where do you see it go? And does it go to just larger, larger? And is that all we need to do? I'm going to start with an anecdote. When when I did the neural language models I don't know, in 2000, uh, I, I, I didn't have the compute to do it. And these are very, very small models by today's standards. I had to like ask someone who had like a big machine with 64 nodes and something that, you know, I didn't have on my desk basically in my lab. Um, of course, by today's standards, these machines are really, really not, not that fast, but, but it was a lot of engineering actually to get it off the ground and it didn't work that great. Like it was epsilon better than, than the, than, than the, um, n-grams, the standard statistical methods of the day. Um, but of course, as people like got more compute and, and, and more data, like our, or the corpus I was, uh, the first corpus I worked on was like the Brown corpus, which is really small. Then we, we went to Wikipedia and, and anyway, just got bigger and bigger. Um, and I think that there was, there's a big shift with attention that really changed the game. But, but a large part of it, as you're implying in your question, is just we train on larger data sets and we have these bigger models and it, it makes a huge difference. And this is, I think, uh, one of the most important discoveries of recent years. Uh, I don't think this is nearly sufficient. Scaling is, I would put it as a, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition to approach human intelligence. Um, it tells me a lot about what we could do um, with large neural nets, you know, and, and, and it helps to anchor their strengths and their weaknesses, with, and, and how you know with how we can complement that that technology and and, and that line, underlying ideas to bridge the gap to human intelligence. So yeah, I think I think there are some qualitative things um, that are missing, but. 
I'm 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 so you know it's exciting and and I'm I'm glad, but I, I'm not in the camp of those who think okay it's just you know more engineering, more scaling, more data, not at all. You're saying not just, but what if you think about what if people do just scale? Do, do you, sounds like you think there's going to be a limit to what it'll give us, but how far away is that limit? You think do you think it's possible that we still have many years ahead of surprising new capabilities by just scaling? Uh, some extent. So uh, we've, as far as I know from talking to people who are building these nets, and I can't do it in my lab, uh, we've essentially reached the amount of available data that's published on the internet in terms of text and probably images. I don't know about the image side, but on the text side, that's what I've been told. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we can probably gain a bit by having even bigger neural nets. But at some point, we need to worry about simple complexity. Like the amount of data that these models need is many orders of magnitude, at least three orders of magnitude above what, say, a uh, five-year-old sees in their life with, with comparable competence, or maybe an eight-year-old. I don't know where you want to put the bar, but but even even a five-year-old would reason better than current language models, uh, state-of-the-art language models. They would know less. Uh -huh. But with the things they know, they would reason out of distribution in ways that our current models do. In particular, they could reason causally. Now, it's interesting. I think the way you pose it is essentially there is maybe larger models have been very impressive. This is my interpretation. They've been very impressive. But the final result of what they do is building up on so much data that actually... There is a better way. I mean, there is a more powerful way to get to those capabilities, which humans showcase. Every, pretty much every human showcases by age three or five um, such capabilities with far less data ever needed to to get there. Exactly. And so maybe it's almost like a parallel quest. It's like build the most capable system today. Maybe for now, try to scale a bit more, but long term, try to build something more human-like, human level might require something different than just pushing the scale. So I I had the thought about how we can escape the simple complexity issue huh. uh, with current approaches. I mean, I have lots of thoughts, mostly where, what I'm thinking about. But I'm going to give you one aspect of it. Currently, the... The complexity of what a large language model can represent is limited by the amount of data that we have to train it and we've reached the limit. Uh, but I think that there's, there's a, like we're leaving a lot of money in the table in the following sense. I think the knowledge that uh, we would like a you know large language model to have could be represented much more compactly. And that we might still need a very large model for doing inference over that model. So this approach, like, like think of like model-based RL. So what does it change? Well, if there is a cheaper representation of the same knowledge that it's basically using, then we need less data to learn it. And of course, you know, we need inductive biases to to be able to do, to do that. But but the point is, I'm, you know, I have the intuition that one way out of this simple complexity issue, besides going to richer inductive biases, is to separate the uh, model part, which is how the world works, from the inference part, which is able to answer any question that we are typically interested in about that that uh, uh, knowledge. And you know, the reason I'm saying these things is also very much inspired by what we know about human recognition that I've been studying in the last few years. The most kind of common thing today to get close to what you're saying would be maybe add retrieval to, to your language model, right? Allow it to retrieve the relevant text and reason over that relevant text to get to an answer. But the essay that you wrote and I was reading earlier this week on inductive biases for deep learning for higher level cognition has 
a, a much more involved like architecture that could I think go a lot further. You want to say a little bit about how, how you see how, how how do we get to the higher level cognition? Yeah. Um. So evolution seems to have made choices for how our brain and, and our mind work with the result being these inductive biases that are associated with higher level cognition that for the most part we don't yet take advantage of in machine learning. Um, the, the one exception is attention, although the way we use attention right now is quite different from what we know about attention in, in the brain. But we can see how powerful attention has been. So imagine we had like 10x that sort of str strength of inductive biases. So what do we know? Um, there is a dominant theory of how conscious processing works in the brain, which is called the global workspace theory that was introduced by uh, by Bernie Bars um, in the 80s and 90s and, um, and, of, and refined by many others, including people like uh, Stan DeHaan, a neuroscientist who you know gave it a sort of a neuroscience kind of anchor and, and data. Um, and it, it centers around this notion that we have a bottleneck in our brain uh, for the information that is selected to become conscious and broadcast to the whole brain and, and available for speaking out what you're thinking. So it's the content of what you're thinking about. It's also called working memory. So, you know, the five or six or seven items that you can hold in your mind at any moment. That's it. That's the bottleneck. And it's kind of weird. Like why would we have such a small number of bits that we can hold when our brain is so much bigger? We have like 80 billion neurons and all their connections, right? So it must be because it has a, a, an evolutionary advantage and it must be a learning advantage, I think. Because uh, it's it's a constraint, right? and we know in machine learning constraints like you know regularizers things like that, they usually represent a strong inductive bias. Okay, so why could that be useful in terms of learning? And the theory I have, which is developed in this paper and others, is that it forces us to represent the joint distribution among the high-level variables that we are manipulating at that conscious level to be formed of, to have a very sparse dependency graph where uh, concepts can only enter in relationship with others through uh, dependencies that involve just maybe two, three, four, five things at most. And our memory is also structured around these little chunks, dependencies, like a sentence. It's also reflected in language, these 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 these, these inductive biases. So, so in other words, uh, there's this uh, sparsity of dependencies that, uh, and and by the way, we we also know that there's a sparsity of dependencies. This is something you can see in language. Like think about uh, a parse of a sentence, like a semantic parse or a dependency parse. It 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 basically relates just a few things together at a time. Of course. You can have many of these dependencies, but the units are involving just a few concepts. Or think about like mathematical formula. How many variables are there? Mm -hmm. Two, three, four, ten? That's it's 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 like we think this way. Okay, so that's like inductive bias number one, but we're not exploiting yet. Um a related one, which we can see also in language, um, is that the the types of these dependencies and are, are I mean these dependencies are reused over and over. Like for example, you have notions of types, so you have different categories like dogs and cats, and lots of things that are true about cats are true for all cats, or you know lots of cats, right? And I can have many cats in the picture. And the same things I know about cats will apply to all of them, right? So this is from a machine learning point of view, you have like, again, a sort of sharing of statistical strength. You have this reuse of components. Um, 
And so that reusability is is a uh, is another inductive bias. And let me tell you about another one, which is maybe of interest to you because it's I think connected to reinforcement learning and robotics. And it's about the action side of our thinking. So if you try to inspect what is going on in your mind while you are planning to do something, you like look at your own thoughts. By the way, this is called metacognition, observing your own thoughts. Uh, um, you, um, you also have this kind of sparsity. How big is a plan? Well, you know, maybe you can like click and, and, and zoom on some things, but, but it just has a few steps. Um, so it has the same kind of organization of a few things at a time that are connected. And then, right. And if you ask like, why did somebody do something or what did somebody do? Like what happened that changed from this scene to this other scene? What explained the new thing that I'm seeing right now outside? Usually we can come up with a single sentence that explains it, or at least we're looking for one. It doesn't always work. So what this says is that change in the world, we attribute to a single agent doing a single thing. So this, this uh, graph of dependencies is also a graph that tells us about how things change in the world, which has to do with causality. And the, the inductive bias is we're expecting that most of the things that change are due initially to like one person, one agent, maybe it's an animal, maybe it's an imagined character that change one element of this graph that modified one variable, opened a door, and now it's kind of cold in the house, right? You can change many things like, you know, there's maybe domino effects, but the initial cause, the we attribute, we try to attribute to like a s very few variables being involved, which we can essentially put in a sentence. Oh, that's the explanation. So it tells something about how we organize our plans, also how we attribute causes, counterfactuals, you know, why people are doing things, intentions, goals. That again, I don't think we're really taking advantage of in in RL and, and, and robotics, for example. It's very interesting that you how you describe essentially the sparse connectivity and the sometimes small information amount bottlenecks yes. as inductive biases that allow for more capable systems. <laughs> the bottleneck makes them more capable. Um, well, well think... okay, I wouldn't say it this way. It, it makes some computations easier, right? So we know that there's a curse of dimensionality if you try to learn the joint distribution between n variables and it goes like the, the number of the amount of data you might need and the amount of compute that you might need is exponential in n that's a curse of a dimensionality either in its computation form or in its statistical form and this bottom line breaks it but of course it's not necessarily like it's not true that this inductive bias works for everything and that's why there's a separation between the low level and the high level. And so at the high level, we have these variables that satisfy these sparsity and bottleneck constraints. And, but not everything can be expressed in words. We know that. Like pixels don't satisfy these constraints. You cannot predict one pixel given just two or three or four others. Now uh, you cannot tell a story about pixels, except if you bring it up to the high level where we have stories. It does make me wonder actually, um, not so much AI related per se, but if, if indeed humans are set up to have these inductive biases to assume sparse, essentially sparse connections triggering potentially domino effects and so forth, but that the core of everything is, is sparse interaction, which I guess Newtonian physics is, is indeed like that. So there's a lot of uh, connection there. But if there are other things in the world that are maybe not so sparse in interaction that humans have a much harder time correctly evaluating what's happening, correctly understanding what's yeah, happening. I'm sure there is. <laughs> we just don't know. <laughs> the things that humans are good at tend to be things where we can come up with a 
like a knowledge representation that satisfies everything that we could put in language satisfies this constraint. And so there, there are like plenty of counterexamples in which deep learning is very good. Like playing Go, for example. It, like, the rules of the game are simple enough. But the inference needed to choose to play well is not easily decomposable into little pieces of knowledge. And, you know, just requiring a few pieces at a time to be able to do something good. That's why there's also a shift from like classical program. Programming is like this too. Yeah, we write these little functions. We have this language where each line has a few symbols, a few function calls. But not everything fits like this. And, and that's where deep learning in its current form is, is beating traditional programming and is, is beating the classical AI ways of doing playing chess or Go. Because we are able to learn these complicated objects, distributions that cannot be reduced to language-like things. So I'm not saying we need to drop that. This is extremely powerful. That's what our current large language models do. That's what our current vision systems do. But we're like missing this other part, which is the high-level cognition. There's a couple of things that stand out to me here that maybe I want to dig a little deeper on. One is the conscious versus unconscious part of what we do and curious about the kind of parts in, in AI that we can have to that. But then another thing, you've, you've come back a several times to this notion that things we can capture in one sentence, Th those things are kind of the nugget of our reasoning and understanding of how the world works, right? Yeah. Um, well, it's it, the conscious understanding. We can have like intuitive physics, for example, may not fit into this. I see. And, and and the question I had around that is essentially, what, what's your thoughts on animals who seem pretty smart but don't don't have language, or it seems like they don't have language at least? Um, yeah, I mean, is it yeah, necessary? These, these are these 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 are good questions. I don't think anybody really has a an answer that they could state with confidence and not boast. Um, and I have cats and they seem to reason to find solutions to problems, even in like uh, a setting where they have zero experience. So they, they seem to put together pieces of knowledge in order to find solutions to problems. Um, but they don't have language. And of course, they're, in many ways, they're stupid as well. Right. Um, so my, my guess is that there, many mammals have a lot of the same machinery, but we've developed it a lot more. And one hypothesis, for example, that, um, I heard uh, philosopher Dan Dennett talk about, which makes sense is the evolution, the, the, the expansion of our linguistic capabilities in, in, uh, in our, in, in the human line. We don't know where exactly, um, has given us, uh, some extra reasoning power and, um, but like, for example, the working memory bottleneck, this is something that most mammals share. And by the way, it's interesting that other, many other animals have a larger working memory bottleneck than we do. Hmm. Really? Yeah. How, like, how do people know that? Oh, they can, they can test that. Like memory is, is just a memory game, right? So, you, you know, you know, they can train, uh, monkeys to play games that they get, they give them rewards. And so they can play memory games, you know, there are all kinds of memory games. And basically the, there's a point at which you start not being able to do well, which is your capacity for short term, very, very short term memorization of arbitrary things. Squirrels have a probably bigger working memory than we do. The thing you said earlier, really, I find it intriguing. Am I interpreting it correctly that that, that statement from the philosopher came down to we, we in the human kind of lineage already had some way of reasoning 
Then we develop speech slash language. Evolutionary pressure became tighter or harder on having the ability to do speech and language because otherwise you can't you know, function as well in a society where everybody else can speak and yeah. understand language. Cooperate. We have very strong competition skills. Right? And in the process, it selected for brains that are also better at reasoning. Yeah. Yeah, I think math is like a side effect of evolution. It was not something that we evolved for. <laughs> Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> um, now, going back to the conscious versus unconscious, like, I guess maybe we can start with something very simple. What, what do humans do conscious versus unconscious? Where, where, where's the line drawn right, right. between those things? So, so it's interesting that the, there's now a lot of work that, well, at least claims to identify that line that you're talking about. So we can observe with various instruments things going on in your in your brain, and and kind of be able to say, ah, uh, this information has reached the conscious level, and we know because we can ask somebody, or a, a monkey. We don't need to ask. We like ask them to do a task that reveals that they know something, um, and we can play with the strength of the signal, so that if it's weak, if it's too weak. We can see that the information is there in their, for example, their visual cortex, but they didn't win the competition. That's the, the way to think about it in the global workspace theory. They didn't, that information didn't pay, I mean, there was not enough attention paid to that. And so it didn't come within the working memory that's broadcast to the whole brain and influences our decisions and actions and so on. So there are correlates of that line between unconscious and conscious that can be uh, measured and that's how we can see, for example, that you become uh, uh, not aware, but your brain kind of knows an information for some time, for a few hundred milliseconds. And, and then something happened called the conscious ignition, where it's like that information suddenly, uh, you know, lots of things light up in, in, in cortex and uh, many parts of your brain, say besides the visual cortex, suddenly know that information and then you can act on it. You can associate it, associate it with other things. You can, you know, talk about it if you're a human, and and the behavior in your brain between those two phases is very clear and distinct. Very clear and distinct in that people measure electromagnetic activities in the brain and see a different yeah. pattern. Yes, yes. Now, as you mentioned earlier, the the way attention works in the brain is supposedly very different from the way it works in our current attention architectures. Yeah. Um, can, can you elaborate on that? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So there are many aspects. Um, so first of all, the brain only has one conscious attention, um, uh, uh, kind of, uh, like being, uh, we choose one thing at a time. And, and that thing, as I said, is like a sentence sort of chunk that have multiple items in it. Um, in a transformer, it's like we are doing all of this computation with attention simultaneously over like all the layers, all the units in the in the same layer. So it's like we've we found that tool and then we we, we replicated it in in many parts of the network. And maybe there are also things like this going on at the unconscious level. So there may be uh, we know that this inhibitory process is going on in the brain. That, that may play a similar role, but there is this one special attention, which is the attention that gives rise to what's called awareness, the thing that you can report verbally, and it's correlated. It's not exactly the same, but, but it's essentially, uh, yeah, one leads to the other, essentially. Um, now, this this conscious attention is, is discrete. Like, you... It's like, you know, the neck cube example I was giving before. You either see the neck cube one way or the other way. You either have dog or cat, or maybe you have a sentence with both, but, you know, there's a competition. It's this sentence, not this other sentence. You don't think two sentences at the same time mixed with some soft weights, which is the current way we do attention. In 2014, when we introduced the modern form of attention that is in Transformers these days, 
uh, we were quite aware that, well, human attention is more like this hard, probably stochastic phenomenon where you choose one thing or the other, like discrete actions in RL. But we chose to do this soft attention because, hey, we can do back prof. It's much more convenient, right? It's just we didn't have the algorithms to conveniently train uh, a system with stochastic hard attention. Actually, in our, like our second paper on attention, we did a comparison between soft attention and stochastic hard attention where the, the policy for choosing is just reinforce, like a very simple uh, RL-like gradient uh, estimator. And I was convinced that the soft attention would be way, way better than, than reinforced. It didn't turn out that way. It was the same. So my interpretation of this is that there is a clear advantage if you can, you know, compute gradients the way we do it in deep learning these days. But there's probably an advantage from the stochastic heart attention that has balanced this out in, in that older experiment from 2015. Um, and and I'm now you know kind of thinking we can design much better algorithms for learning to attend uh, in a way that's stochastic hard decisions, just like with conscious attention. Now, wh when I think about hard attention, you lose a lot. And so it's interesting to hear you say that you think you might be able to learn equally fast because once you apply a hard attention, you essentially discarded so much information that you could have passed on. And yeah, there's no yeah. backpropagation for that anymore. It's just, it, it, it's yeah. gone from this counter equation flow. Yet somehow, it just seems like fundamentally it's less efficient to learn that way, but when uh, you think it doesn't Well, okay, so you have to remember it's an inductive bias. So inductive biases like, you know, regularizers in machine learning, they make your life harder. Like, you know, they, in the sense that the, right. they restrict your capacity. So we had a paper, I think at New York's 2021, where we took, um, a, a, like to trans transformer like architecture and we replaced, uh, the communication between layers that used to be soft attention uh, by something that involves discretization. And we use some tricks to backprop through discretization, which I don't particularly like, but actually the, these, these tricks have been very popular. Uh, I had another paper about these tricks in 2013, I think. Anyways, but the interesting thing is that by forcing to discard information to go from a, a continuous. So basically we had an encode, like it, uh, there's a paper called VQVE, which came before ours that had a similar thing where you, you have a communication between two parts of the network and you create a discrete bottleneck. So you've got a vector in, you, 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 you decide of a symbol that has its own embedding and you take the nearest neighbor, you send the, the, uh, discrete ID of that symbol to the other guy and the other guy then retranslates back into a vector and then, you know, it's all continuous after that. Right. So we, we just made this discretization bottleneck of communication between different parts and it got better out of this regionalization in, in our experiments. And you know, why would it help, right? Because you're discarding information. The theory I have is it. You know, why would symbols help when you could just do continuous vectors? And the, 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 the thought I had at the time, which I still think makes a lot of sense is you create a plug and play scenario. So if I describe something with a sentence, um, and I, instead of having like a very detailed description of the image of a dog, I just have the word dog. It's applicable to all of the images of a dog. And maybe I can reason at that level and discard all those details. Also, if you think about different parts of your brain communicating, so let's say fire, well, you could hear fire, you could 
see fire, you can smell fire. You you want the different parts of your brain to be able to like exchange information in a way that they can quickly learn that common language. By the way, that idea of a common language, different parts between different parts of the brain is an idea from Bernie Bars again from the black late eighties. And um, so you you now have this very um, constrained communication form that so think about how easy it is for us to learn uh, a different language right um, it's easy because the words have a restricted capacity each word and so you can you know you can get uh, you don't need to know about the details of how the fire arose it's fire and and you can just plug that into everything you know about fires so you can see that it's an inductive bias that allows to separate pieces of knowledge, like the details about how the fire looks like from, well, what you need to do when there's a fire, for example. If you had a rich continuous representation, then what happens is that all of those details want to sneak in. And then it's it gets harder to generalize to a different kind of fire that maybe comes from a different sensory modality. This makes me think we should do more work on multimodal learning, everything you described there, collecting multimodal data sets and, and see what, what can be achieved with them. For sure. The general view that what we are doing with our body sensors is extracting views, very potentially very, very different views of the world. And even in our eyes, right, we can change uh, the way, where we look and so on. Um, but, but it's all like different views on a very complicated reality. And it's difficult to piece those views together. Very, very difficult. So having a combinatorial language to express those connections can be extremely convenient. Yeah. That, may, that makes me excited to push that direction more myself. Um, very inspiring. That's, that's sure. the purpose of... The kind of thing I'm talking about, getting people excited, because I think there's there's a lot to reap yet um, that's quite different in nature from what we've been pushing in the last few years in deep learning. And by the way, also quite different from the way people have been thinking about it in classical symbolic AI, rule-based symbolic AI, logical thing. I think there's interesting inspiration to have from that work that dates back from you know many decades and he's very rich, but as is, it doesn't fit the you know, net picture. It doesn't fit the sort of deep learning, rich learning capabilities that we've built. Um, so the way I'm thinking about this is more, how can we make deep, deep nets, how we make neural nets, uh, represent that sort of combinatorial discrete structure, uh, that's inspired by how commission works and, um, and, 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 you know, reap all of the advantages, but not throw away the baby with the bathwater. Can you say a bit more about what are GFlow networks? So yeah, they're really motivated by how we can train this kind of attention policy that we've been talking about that selects, um, and combines pieces of knowledge, uh, discrete concepts. Um, in order to find solutions to problems, to uh, reason, to plan, um, everything that we see our higher consciousness do. So what are what they are? Uh, they're somewhere near the intersection of uh, generative models, reinforcement learning, and variational methods. And the main thing that a GFO net learns is a generative policy that can construct a data structure. So think about a graph, but really think this graph is meant to represent a thought, not, not necessarily like a linear sequence of words, but more like think of the semantic parts, like how these words are related to each other through relations. So this is a data structure, which again, I like to think of as a graph. And and these, these GFLNS can construct, can generate such data structures sequentially just like your thoughts go sequentially, uh, you know, one little piece at a time builds up. And 
in that sense, you could think, oh, it's just an RL method um, because you learn a policy that it tries to achieve something. But the typical RL is trying to find a sequence of actions that maximizes a reward function. Whereas GFlow nets are trying to send pull these structures, these objects, with probability proportional to the reward you get. So there's a subtle difference here, and there are connections to existing work in RL. The, the connection to generative models is that, well, it's a generative model, right? You can you can uh, train these things to generate objects. You train a sampler. Um, and the connection to variational methods is, is a bit more technical, but um, uh, you're not able to, uh, to uh, let's say, directly learn a sample. There's, there's a, the loss function for, for GFLN as I mean, like probabilistic learning things like in variational methods are essentially intractable. So it's not like in normal supervised learning where you can say, oh, I have a loss function I can back propagate and, and, and so, so in in the variational world, what we do is we 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 have you know a proxy, something that we can differentiate, and it's going to be a loss function that's going to allow us to train the machinery that does what we want. Say inference, you know, sampling things with the right probabilities. Um, and by the way, this is very convenient to represent Bayesian posteriors or any kind of posterior probabilistic posteriors because. When you want to sample from, say, P of, um, uh, say, parameters given data, uh, it, it's it's intractable to compute that that probability, but it's easy to compute the joint of P of data and 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 data, uh, P of parameters and data. Um, so we can get an unnormalized reward, which is how well do you fit the data and the prior, and we can train. Uh, a neural net to sample the parameters uh, in proportion to that reward. So, so that's some, something we've started playing with, and we have one paper already on. But yeah, so GFlow nets are uh, interesting because uh, they also not only allow us to learn to sample objects, but also as a side effects of that, we're also learning what's called marginalization. Uh, quantities like um, a, the probability of some subset of, uh, uh, of variables where you ignore a bunch of others. In other words, you're summing over all these other things. That again is an intractable thing. So you can you can learn probabilities over any like subset of quantities that you care about. So a thought is usually a subset of all the things you could think about, about, uh, say, an input or a plan. And in order to properly manipulate this kind of uh, objects, you need a, a partial inference. Uh, what I mean by this is when you plan something, you don't think about all the details, right? You're throwing away a lot of information about the state. Or if, you, if, you, if you're doing caption generation, right? So you have an image, and there are lots of things you could say about that image. But but somehow you get to focus on just a few aspects. And implicitly what you're doing when you do that is you modulize over all the other things you're not saying that are also true. And g is are good for doing this sort of thing. I like what you described is what what does the training data look like to train a G-Flow net? Yeah. So normally when we train a neural net these days, um, like a large language model, uh, it, if we need... If we want the language model to represent something very complicated, we need a lot of data to go with that. This like basic learning theory. Yeah. Um, but here we are in a slightly different situation because we are doing this separation of model, which is the reward function, like how things work. Are these concepts consistent, coherent with each other? I like to think of these as like an energy function. Um, so there's the model part, how things work in the world, and then there's the inference part. But and 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 you know we would use the G net for doing the inference part. And and once you have inference, you can you can help to learn the model as well, like in BAEs, for example. 
But but the thing is, if you think about how we train an inference machine, uh, we don't need to train it with real data. It can query the model, like a model-based RL, right? So if you if you if you want to train a policy, I mean that's the way we train you know Go playing machine. The model is the thing that that we that runs the simulation. You don't actually need to play with a human. You know the rules, so you can. You can just uh, generate as much data as you want. This is fake data, um, and and so now the the having a very large like neural net of the kind we love these days could be useful, even if the data set is small, because what you're learning is how to convert the knowledge in the data set into a model, and then convert that model into Machine, a machine that can answer questions as inference. Probably that's really, yeah, that's really interesting. But yeah, because the GFU network is a learned sampler, exactly. But next to it, there is another learned, I think, learned entity. Yes, yes. which corresponds to reward or energy. Yeah, how do you get that? Well. It's interesting. There are several ways. Uh, we have a paper out where we use a, a classical energy-based learning framework. So if you want to do maximum likelihood learning of an energy function, so there's a long literature uh, tradition, um, the hard part is to have a sampler. People typically use something like NCMC. But you can replace the NCMC by a GFLNet, essentially. So so that's one approach, but there's an even more exciting approach where you don't even need to sample data at all, because I don't think our brain samples images, for example. You just need to sample the high level stuff um, and potentially things like a causal graph or you just, one way to think about it is you can sample parameters. And in that case, so th th these are two ways. There's a one way is the classical maximum likelihood uh, energy-based learning approach. And another way that we've uh, been working with is uh, the Bayesian approach, which I think is more like what the brain does. When I'm reading the GFLOW net papers and the, the write-up summarizing it, um, I'm really inspired. Partially also because it seems like there's still a lot of opportunity for future work. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I think we're just like opening the door to uh, all kinds of uh, algorithms and architectures and ways of thinking about problems that is heavily inspired by everything we already know, but but is also kind of a, in a different category. And it seems like GFONS is one incarnation, but there's the, the bigger principle of how you model something compactly could be separate from your inference system, which might be much more computationally heavy, yeah. but because you model something separately more compactly, you need a lot less data. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the, the, the promise of, you know, that has been the promise of model-based RL since the beginning, right? True. Um, but we can, we can apply this thinking not just to RL, this could be, you know, also in cases where there is no sequence of decisions. It's just there's knowledge and there's inference, questions you'd like to answer. And it fits very well what we know about uh, high level cognition. So if uh, I tell you, oh, there's been a change in the traffic laws. Now we have to all drive on the left. Or, you know, that can happen if you just go to London. Um, you, it's it's instantaneous. You can change your your model part. You can change one little rule somewhere. What is not instantaneous is that now you need to fine tune your your inference machine. But it's very fast, and it can happen in your mind, or maybe while you're dreaming, not even conscious of it. So you know it, it's very plausible that we are like tr our inference machine trains itself on to be consistent with our uh, knowledge. In fact, one way I like to think about GFLNS at a different from a different angle is that it it's all about different pieces of knowledge, like the inference of the model in, in what I'm talking about, 
becoming consistent with each other. The whole training procedure for G Flow Nets is you have different parts of the system and they want to be consistent with each other. The whole learning procedure is self consistency. Uh, and that you can see that flavor already exists, for example, in temporal difference learning, like Bellman equation. It's all about local temporal consistency of uh, predictions of, about rewards, right? What you described reminds me of a couple other things, Ted. Um, really, I find exciting connections, I guess, is one is in reinforcement learning, reward shaping plays a very big role in the speed of learning, right? And so it seems like if you can learn a very well-shaped compact model, whatever the counterpart would be outside of reinforcement learning, it could potentially allow the inference system to to be learned much faster, right? Um, even though it might be less compact, because in reinforcement learning, there's always that trade-off, very sparse reward, easy to specify, yeah. but now slow to learn. And so there's there's kind of a spectrum of what you're willing to do with the reward. And I'm curious what you think with the G flow nets of the part that is the counterpart of the reward, the energy function. Do you see a similar spectrum of of possibilities? Yes. So one of the things I'm thinking about these days, but really I don't feel like I have a mature understanding, is how we could use things like G flow nets to do um, planning uh, at an abstract level and hierarchical enforcement learning. And even in an unsupervised way where you discover these high level representations uh, that have compositional structure like like sentences, right? So think about your plans, they basically can be translated into sentences um, that have this compositional structure. Um, and I, yeah, I I think that uh, the, the there's a there's a way to make the composition structure in the model, like we have these little energy functions that relate a few variables at a time, can be matched with the way the, the sampler, the GFlow net does its work because the sampler, the GFlow net goes like one little sentence at a time as well. And so it doesn't need to pay attention to everything like all parts of the state either. So this is the partial state idea that I think we haven't been exploiting much yet in, in RL. Now, Yosha, whatever we talked about so far, um, it's been about how can we get AI, fundamental AI advances that bring us closer to maybe human level capabilities, not just capabilities, but also learning speeds. Um, but it turns out you also do a lot of work that's much more directly focused on having impact today in the world with what AI can already do today. What are some of the things that you've been really excited about recently? So it's also connected to GFlow nets, actually. Uh, we can use GFlow nets to do interesting experimental design. So what is experimental design? It's a, it's a meaning, how do I choose my actions? Uh, but in a scientific context. So let's say I'm interested actually these days in the problem of antimicrobial resistance. In other words, uh, there's like a real threat for all of us that the next pandemic might wipe us out because uh, bugs are developing uh, resistance to the drugs that we have. In fact, there's already like a bunch of bacteria that for which there's no antibiotic that exists. Unfortunately, they're not too virulent, but they could mutate any day and and you know become worse than than uh, what we got with COVID nineteen. Uh, it's true for bacteria, it, you know, the same thing happened with viruses and fungus. Okay, so why do I bring this up? Because I think there is a huge uh, transformative potential coming in the intersection of AI and biology uh, because there's been an incredible progress in uh, technology in biology to measure things and experiment at a large scale. So we can measure the expression of, of a cell, single cell, and you know measure thousands or you know even full genome, twenty thousand quantities. Um, we can take snapshots of this. We can make perturbations of the cell. So th these are the actions, the experiments. What should I try next as a biologist trying to understand how a cell um, reacts to COVID nineteen or to some uh, future bug. How do we figure that out? Well, 
the way that scientists do this is they do experiments. The traditional way of doing experiments is, you know, a, a biologist or a chemist thinks about it and says, oh, let's do this, let's do that. And these experiments have to be written down in text. They have to come out of your conscious processing. And that's a bottleneck. But now we have these machines that can do millions of experiments in parallel. We need AI to help us deal with that. I mean, take advantage of that. And then measure millions of things. So like our human mind is, is you know, is beautiful, but it's not suited to the current possibilities of science in many areas. So where does machine learning come in? Well, there's the modeling part. How do we build, for example, a causal model of the data we've observed that broken that breaks down the the knowledge into small pieces that are that have compositional structure? That's essentially what it is. And then having that model, which by the way should be Bayesian, because we need to entertain multiple theories that explain the data. How do we decide what the next experiment of you know a million things should be? And we've been using GPLNets for uh, both. But, but in particular, most of the papers have been on, on the experimental design part. And what happens is, um, because they sample proportionally to the reward, if you sample many times, you will get, if there are many modes to the reward function, you will kind of cover the modes very naturally, right? So if I give you a sampler for a distribution and the distribution is highly multimodal, and you can just sample IID from it a thousand times, you'll get a thousand say, candidate drugs that you could try that all seem good according to the reward function. So we've been exploring that thread and working with biologists and chemists to see how these tools could be, uh, you know, used in, you know, real experiments. So we've been working with uh, published data sets, but now the real game is, of course, is to use this in real new experiments, not the databases and data sets that exist. Um, so, so that's one example, but you could use the same general experimental loop um, structure where we can use machine learning for both modeling and experimental design. Oh, and we can use robotics to do the experiments faster. This is actually happening at the same time to scale up the experimental capabilities. So machine learning is all over the place and people like um, uh, Alan Esparukuzik has quoted, you know, this uh, term of uh, self-driven labs, right? So basically it's a full like scientific loop where everything is machine controlled. We're, and I don't think we're there yet, but, but this is, this is where we, you know, we want to go. I mean, machine humans will be in the loop because the, there are lots of decisions to take at, a, at an abstract level, but the more we can automate this process, um, the the more power we can we can get. Are there any specific diseases that you think of that this could impact, or is this more of a when something new surfaces that we've never done anything with before, we can as quickly as possible get on it and and I guess get rid of it. So I think the the framework that I'm talking about, and I'm not the only one to talk about, but I, 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 my group is using GFLONES, but people have been thinking about the how machine learning could be used in science in this way for a while now. Um, it, this could be applied to uh, everything in 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 in, in the uh, like uh, medicinal world, but also even more generally. But I'm more interested in the areas where industry is not going because it's not profitable, but the value to society or the cost of not doing anything to society is huge. So, for your information, for example, the problem of uh, antimicrobial resistance is projected to cost 100 trillion US dollars by 2050 and to yield 10, you know, to, to cause 10 million deaths per year. That's more than COVID. And it's year after year. It's not just a two year thing. And, and the industry doesn't do much because there's a market failure, which you've been long to explain, and, and they, they don't have any incentives to really do the right innovations. For this, so I think academics need to get into these things, and 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 the other like big problem, of course, that everybody has heard more about is climate change, and and a lot of what we've been doing in my group uh, are uh, is is motivated by that as well. It turns out you can use the same techniques of 
you know, uh, scientific discovery, uh, machine learning tools for discovering new materials that can be used, for example, for, um, uh, storage of energy, uh, for carbon capture or for better batteries. So these are examples. Uh, but of course, you know, there, there's also a lot of, uh, more common commercial uses of having machine learning to help in material design. And by the way, this is an area where, um, uh, robotics is, is, is quite important because we don't have the paralyzation of biology as a, as a sort of cheap trick that, that we can use. That's really interesting. I mean, when, when you think about, I mean, these automated lives from materials for cures effectively to diseases, I mean, it, it, it's one gigantic machine run by an AI that is tr trying to solve, or it's not so much solve a specific problem, it's more like optimize against an objective, trying to you know, do better than humans have been able to discover so far. Actually, it's not optimize. I've learned to try to remove that word from my vocabulary oh. and, and replace it by explore. Hmm. So optimize is what like our usual RL does and our optimization methods, of course. But in many cases, what you want is not optimize, but sample all the good things. So there may be a lot of solutions to a problem. And sometimes you just need one solution that's optimized. Sometimes you really need to have as many of them as possible. And there are many reasons why you would like to have many of them. Uh, the, I mean, if you're Bayesian, this is going to create a safer decision-making process. If you uh, think about drugs, it's because the way that we are constructing the reward function is imperfect. At the end of the day, there's going to be a clinical trial. And th the, our reward function in the computer is not a, a good rendering of what's going on in a clinical trial. And we don't have enough data in, you know, from clinical trials to train a system. So we have these proxies. And so you want to make sure you have a diversity of solutions. If you have you know, many solutions that are just a small variation of each other, and somehow, you know, they all die, they, they all don't work in the clinical trial because there is something fundamental that you're missing, then you're in trouble. But if you had covered all the ways, all the solutions, and you still have some that survive the filter of reality, then this is, this is quite important. Recently, there's been the Montreal Declaration for a Responsible Development of Artificial Intelligence. And uh, you have a commentary uh, written around that. Can you say a little bit about that? And wh why is it important? And, and why are you involved? Okay, so actually we did this in 2016 and it came out in 2017. So this is the time when people started to realize that AI would be deployed in society. You know, this is after the, the Google and Facebook and Microsoft and of this world started investing a lot in, in, in deep learning. And I'm really worried that we're not very wise in how we uh, use our technology. And it's going to get worse because we're building technology that's more and more powerful. So the analogy I like is we've built these, so think about like nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Like we, we built these scientific understanding that can be transformed into tools. And those tools could be weapons or it could be used to control people. Uh, for example, you know, deep learning could be used to monitor people and, and track them in the streets and so on. And or <laughs> on the web and 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 so on. Um but I don't think that we have the uh collective wisdom and social uh, social norms and, and laws and political and economic systems that can handle that kind of power. So it's like, you know, everybody can, can build a nuclear weapon. Well, what's going to happen? Some angry guy probably is going to be just say, ah, no, 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 no. press the button and kill a million other people, right? Or maybe a billion. So we can't afford that. Maybe things are already pretty bad with climate and so on. But uh, so we need we need to think collectively about how we uh, 
where do we draw the line between what we want to do with AI and what we don't want to do? And we need governments to get um, to regulate, even if it means slowing down. It's okay. It's the, the the flip side is the destruction, wars, um, and what makes things hard is that, of course, different countries may have different ways of thinking about this, and they ideally they should all agree on some 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 norms. But we are so far from that. I'm very concerned. And so, are you looking for a way to to rally leadership in different countries? And when you think about leadership, are you thinking scientific leadership? Are you thinking even all the way to the level of political leadership? Yeah, one of the sort of small pet projects that I got into is can you use machine learning uh, to help uh, develop a more practical game theory strategy so that even in a world where there's not a central uh you know world government um are there strategies that individual agents like countries can take for example by making deals with other countries to make sure we don't you know lose all together because of uh the tragedy of the commons and instead the self-interest of every other country will be to join that collective, you know, set of rules. Like we need to regulate the climate, and we need to regulate AI, and we need to regulate biotechnology, and all these like powerful and important things. And we need to agree on vaccines and all these things that we're not able to do properly. Um, so I think that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know that we'll figure it out, but we launched a competition. Uh, where you know different machine learning groups could compete to propose um, uh, policies that uh, could be trained on a simulator we're providing um, that allow you know individual countries to uh, negotiate with other countries, and then we can see what happens with a economic and climate simulation with with those policies uh, after a few decades. That's really interesting. But when you say after a few decades, really, yeah, I mean, in a simulation, in a simulation, you can run, yeah, you can run much faster. You you can right. hopefully find out very soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, it's not, thank God, the real world. Right? This is a simulation, right? But but I think these kinds of tools can help us, um, even if they are just models. Well, this is all really inspiring, Joshua. Uh, makes me curious. Um, I mean, you, you're getting so much work done. Uh, do you ever relax? And what do you do to unwind and relax? Um, I walk. <laughs> what do you do during Montreal winters? To unwind? Every morning, uh, I go out. Uh, I mean, there, like, if it's really, if the weather is really bad, but it's like once every month that i miss it so you know in 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 winter we you, know, you could just dress up and by the way when you walk and I, I my walks actually involve climbing i mean climbing yeah you know, by foot not 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 uh sports thing and it's very you warm up very quickly i like, uh, but the the interesting thing is when you're walking your brain works differently. Like I think half of my ideas are coming from these walks. Or either like well it's either the walks or when I wake up. Hmm. Um so when I wake up I, I I try to avoid having an alarm and I don't I don't, you know, get up right away. I leave like my my mind wandering, eyes closed for at least half an hour. And the walks I think they bring oxygen to the brain or something. And it's amazing. Like things that sounded like really complicated and I didn't know what to do. Suddenly solutions pop up. It's this charge of machine that we have in our brain that, uh -huh. that comes up that infers potential solutions to problems. Just need to activate it. Yeah. We all have it. It's very easy. Just walk. I mean, I, I think you have to walk in it, like not in traffic or something. Like you need to be free. Your mind needs to be free, right? I love this. I mean, this is this is great. And I hope uh, I hope my own students, when they hear this, start start 
taking more walks and uh, let their mind wander uh, in the morning when they wake up. <laughs> um, I'm also very curious about the kind of the trajectory that got you where you are today. Um, obviously, today you're ex- you know, top established person in AI, but I mean, you you started as a kid somewhere, right? That's right. And, and in France, you weren't there instantly, right? So, w- w- what are some of the things that really, when you look back, stand out in your mind about your path from you know being just a kid, probably just playing things, yeah. to where you're now? Well, as a kid, I was uh, not very social, and you know, I was kind of the nerd type, and you know, and, uh, I I went to the library and. I I I spent a lot of time just thinking and not doing anything. Um, and I was lucky enough that my parents uh, helped to give me a lot of self confidence. Uh, it's it's unfortunate that not having enough self confidence really kills a research career. I've seen really smart people that were just too inhibited, uh, lacking confidence to um, take the time to like push your own ideas so so that's one aspect um, I've been very lucky in my trajectory to meet people you know like like Jan LeCarin, Jeff Hinton many others that were initially role models for me and uh, and to quickly get into a scientific community that uh stimulated me a lot and um and one thing that really i think helped me is i'm i'm the kind of person that keeps asking the why question like i think we never do enough of it so people will read a paper or like uh, i will tell something to my students and they will say yeah 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 and they don't actually like understand it or understand at the level that they could like prove it to someone else or you need to be able to prove it to yourself I don't mean just math like just I, I think we take things for granted too easily as humans for you know probably inherited reasons and as scientists we need to question things all the time so if you use an algorithm why does it work what's the intuition um, it's it's asking those questions, I think, that, that feeds the, the thinking machine. Now, one thing you said was you think you're very fortunate that your parents um, had to grow up with a lot of confidence, all right, that they instilled that in you. Are there things that stand out, maybe specific memories or general principles you think they followed that kind of l- led to you building that confidence? They gave me a lot of freedom as well. And I try to do the same thing with my own grad students, which means they don't always do the things I would like, but it works because when children or researchers have freedom, magic comes out. <laughs> uh, and and also I think my parents were a little bit, especially my father was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He came from the time of the student revolutions of the 60s, and uh, he, he wanted to question everything in society. Um, so I think that's that's a good base for a scientist. Um, and and I guess the self-confidence just comes with uh, more like the mother thinking their child is uh, so special. <laughs> oh, she was right, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> I don't think she could anticipate <laughs> what happened later. Yeah. Now, when we think a bit, a bit further along, let's say students, undergraduate students or early PhD students, um, any advice you might have for them to build their careers? Yeah. Um, uh, I think many grad students in, in machine learning get their hands dirty. So that's, that's good. This is important. You have to build your own intuitions. It's connected to what I said about asking questions. Um, and, and you have to read a lot 
but not trust everything you read because it's you know other people's thoughts and sometimes it's right sometimes it's wrong it can be inspiration um and collaborate so there's there's such a a wrong meme in our society about how science works like you know some genius is coming up with crazy ideas in their garage or their isolated mountain of course that's not how it works you and i know that right we we talk to people we stimulate each other and even though i was not a very social person initially i i realized quickly as you know early as a phd student that it was through the discussions with others and and choosing who you're going to be working with is much more important than in what university or what lab, but like the people that you collaborate with, that they're going to stimulate you. They're going to um, question your ideas and they're, they're going to come up with things that you didn't think about. Um, so we need to cultivate that. And it, it, I've always thought of my group as a, kind of a family right, where we, there's enough trust that people will be feel free to to share their crazy thoughts and 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 not feel like that they might say something stupid and and feel bad about it. Well, that's really great advice. Uh, well, Yoshra, it's such a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks so much for making the time. My pleasure. Thanks for all the great questions and the discussions. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation just as much as I did please give us a thumbs up, leave a comment, put a rating. It'll help other people find the show. Thank you.